Uh, I'm Jim Minow, Executive Director of the CureJM Foundation. Thank you all for being with us. I know we've got uh, more people joining as, uh, as I speak. We are also recording this session, uh, so it will be available on our, <clears throat> uh, on our website. It can be distributed to families in, in, the, in the future. Uh, I want to thank uh, our, uh, our uh, presenters um, today, Jessica Neely um, and uh, Nikki Hahn, who is uh, the uh, chairman of the Board of Directors of the Cure JM Foundation. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and introduce uh, Jessica right now. She is, um, uh, Jessica was actually uh, one of our very first Cure JM fellows at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, Benioff Children's Hospital, which is also now um, our most recent uh, Cure JM Center of Excellence, where she serves as co director. Um, we have funded uh, several research projects with Jessica over the years, and uh, she's a graduate of the University of Kentucky um, School of Medicine and, uh, and a rising star among JDM researchers everywhere. Uh, it's my, uh, my pleasure as we look at uh, the importance of autoantibodies in, uh, in, in cure JM diagnosis and care uh, to turn this over now to Dr. Jessica Neely. Jessica. Great. Thank you so much. And yes, thank you um, for all your support of, of my work over the years. It's been really instrumental. Um, let me share some slides here. Um, okay, so um, today, as you know, the topic is myositis-specific antibodies, what families need to know. And I did want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, like Jim said, I'm originally from Kentucky and that's where I grew up um, in a little town um, in Western Kentucky, kind of on the border of Indiana. Um, did my medical school at University of Kentucky and then moved out to um, San Francisco in 2013 where I did um, both pediatrics residency and pediatric rheumatology fellowship at UCSF. Um, we are very um, thankful for the recent designation of the Cure JM COE, and uh, we actually have our first uh, JDM clinic next week, which we're really excited about. And then uh, I I direct the translational research component of the COE, and I spend about seventy five percent of my um, of my time doing translational research, and the other twenty five percent taking care of patients. Um, the rest of my time I spend with my family. This is my husband, Stefan, and my uh, two-year-old son, Remy. And this is us at Point Lobos State Park um, near Big Sur. So to really understand... Right, you want to see this? This is about JDM. I think someone has their, their sound on. Um, so I think to, to really uh, kind of understand how we think about myositis-specific antibodies as um, pediatric rheumatologists and how you can think about them too, I think we need to kind of start with what we know about the cause of JDM. And we do believe it is an autoimmune disease. And this means that um, it's a disease caused by uh, some aspect of our immune system not working properly and becoming overly active and attacking our body's own tissues. This is a, um, a very oversimplified schematic of our immune system, um, at least what we know. And as you can see, even in this simplified diagram, it's very complex. So there's multiple different immune cell types. And there's actually research to support a role for most of these cell types in, um, in JDM. So we think it's a very complex immune process. There's also um, research to show that um, there's a role for genetics. So these are certain changes in our own DNA code that affect how the immune system functions. Um, but we know that that alone doesn't explain the cause. And then there's also other things in our environment that um, play a role in the disease, such as sun exposure, um, also exposure to certain viruses, and perhaps other factors that we don't know about yet. And because I know that all of you um, probably use Google, if you Google dermatomyositis, you will see that there's a strong association, association with cancer. 
Um, but I mentioned this only to let you know, this is only true in adults. We do not see this at all in children. Um, so there are still a lot of questions in terms of how the interplay of these various factors work together to cause disease. Um, but when they do in, um, but when they do cause JDM, the, the main symptoms that we see are skin and muscle disease. And we see very characteristic rashes that help us make the diagnosis. Um, so this is the Gotrans rash that occurs over the finger uh, joints and then the heliotrope rash that occurs over the eyelids. And in terms of the muscle disease, these tend to, uh, it tends to affect muscles that occur in the center of um, our bodies. So it causes a lot of pain and weakness in um, like the trunk, the abdomen, um, the gluteal muscles and thighs and shoulders as well. Um, many patients experience fatigue, fever, and weight loss. Um, arthritis can be present. Um, other organ involvement is typically rare, but the two most common organs that could be involved are um, the lung and the gut. But what is really important to know and what really kind of baffles us as pediatric rheumatologists is that JDM really can appear very differently in each child. Um, so we see a very wide range of um, disease severity in terms of how sick patients are. Um, we see a wide range of symptoms in terms of like types of rashes, um, how weak a patient may be, whether they do have um, gut or lung involvement, whether they develop certain complications of the disease, and also a wide range of um, treatment response or disease course. So um, sort of the classic teaching is that there are kind of three main disease courses, and there's about a third of patients that fall into each category, though that's likely um, an oversimplification, but uh, the first category is monocyclic disease course, meaning the disease happens, it's treated, and it doesn't come back. The second one is polycyclic, uh, where the disease is treated, and then there are flares over time. And the last category is um, more chronic disease course, where we have uh, more difficulty uh, sort of controlling symptoms and also coming off of uh, medications. So what would be um, really helpful for us as rheumatologists and you all as um, patients and parents is to be able to um, have some way to predict these different outcomes um, early in the disease course and to use that information to um, help our management plan and our treatment plan. And uh, something like that is called a biomarker um, in the scientific world. And there is some evidence that perhaps myositis specific antibodies may be a biomarker in JDM. So um, the first question that you probably have is like, what is an antibody? And if we go back to our um, schematic of the immune system, we have our more longer term immune system here, which is the B and the T cells. And uh, you've probably heard a lot about B, and B cells and T cells uh, during the pandemic, but our B cells produce antibodies. And the role of these antibodies in a normal immune response is to um, attach to uh, infectious particles. Um, so here we have a coronavirus. And whenever there are enough antibodies that attach to the virus, it gets um, removed from our body. So that's how it is typically supposed to work. In autoimmune diseases, uh, these antibodies get um, the wrong instructions and they, instead of attacking infections, attack our body's own tissues. And uh, they may do this sort of directly or indirectly by affecting other parts of the immune system. Uh, we don't really know exactly how that happens, but we do think that these um, myositis specific antibodies potentially play a role in disease because they are so 
um, it's kind of in the name myositis specific, meaning they're really only found in patients with myositis. So that seems like a clue that they are important. And then in terms of how we can use them in the clinic, um, there has been several research, uh, there have been several research studies that have shown that these myositis specific antibodies really are associated with unique characteristics in patients. Um, so we found that they may uh, provide some prognostic information, meaning um, information about the disease course and how patients might respond to treatment. Um, they are associated with certain symptoms. So I highlighted associated here because um, not all patients that have an MSA have these symptoms that we're going to talk about. Uh, and then there's some limited evidence that they may help to guide treatment decisions. And I'll um, share a little bit about that as well. So there are um, several myositis specific antibodies, but the ones that are most commonly associated with JDM are um, these three. So anti-P155-140. Uh, I put both names because I'm not sure um, exactly how your rheumatologist has um, discussed it with you. <clears throat> and then there is also uh, anti-MJ, which we also call NXP2, and anti-MDA5. And Dr. Uh, Lisa Ryder, who's a very prolific JDM researcher, if you haven't um, heard of her or met her before, um, you probably will at some point. Uh, she's also very involved in CureJM. She developed this um, review article and these um, pictures to help us kind of visually recognize these symptoms that are associated with these antibody classes. Um, so I will walk through each of these individually. So anti-P155-140 or TIF1 gamma, this is the most common autoantibody in uh, JDM, uh, present in 23 to 30% in, um, in Dr. Ryder's NIH study. These patients um, typically had an average onset, um, average age of onset, so around seven years. And as you can see from this picture, um, patients with this autoantibody were more likely to have uh, quite extensive skin rash. So there's a lot of um, redness in, you know, really all over the body. And these rashes tended to be uh, more sensitive to the sun so they could get worse um, in sun exposure. Um, these patients had more, more likely to have a chronic illness course. Um, but I wanted to include the percentage of 65% in this study. Um, so that means 35% did not have a chronic illness um, course, which is what we mean by an association. Um, and these patients were more often more likely to have a mild to moderate um, severity of disease. There are two uh, complications that we worry about in JDM, lipodystrophy and calcinosis. Um, these are both very rare, but there was a slight association with uh, lipodystrophy in this MSA class. The next one is anti-MJ or anti-NXP2. And this is the next most common MSA that we see in JDM, 12 to 23%. Uh, they were ever so slightly younger, um, but they have a lot more muscle involvement. So more weakness, um, they reported muscle cramps, um, contractures are where the joints um, can get a bit stiff because of the muscle disease. And uh, they were less likely to have rashes, especially rashes in this area, um, kind of over the chest and the back. And uh, they were more likely to have the gut involvement, though that is, is still rare, um, <clears throat> and more likely to have that monocyclic disease course, meaning uh, they're treated and able to come off medicine and um, don't have a flare. Um, this had a, an association with the development of calcinosis, uh, which is, again, a complication of sort of prolonged um, uh, disease activity that isn't being treated appropriately or not responding to treatment. 
And the last class, which is um, the least common in uh, the U.S. and the U.K., um, about five to seven percent in in those countries um, is much more common in patients of Asian descent. So in a Japanese study, up to 33 percent of patients had MDA5 antibodies. Um, these patients also have an average age of onset, um, but they do have a very unique presentation. So um, we often do see um, these oral and skin ulcerations. So the, the um, skin disease is more severe. And we also see a lot of arthritis in these patients, but very little muscle disease. Um, so this picture is kind of pointing out the joints um, and then there is a strong association with the development of lung disease. And at least in some studies, not in others, um, this has been rapidly progressive lung disease. So very important to detect early and treat. Um, in the UK study, they did find that um, those that they identified and treated did um, have inactive disease by two years. So it seems to um, respond well to treatment, but this is overall a, a more unique uh, presentation that we, that we recognize. So how, how does knowing these symptoms and these, these characteristics that are associated with MSA classes, how does that help impact our disease management? So um, one thing, uh, since we just talked about MDA5, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we think about MDA5 disease. So if we suspect MDA5 disease, either by those specific symptoms that we see, um, or because we do get the test back quickly, uh, we will do very early screening for lung disease, which is not um, typical for all JDM patients. We don't always uh, do sort of imaging of the lungs or any lung tests. And um, in those patients that do present with those classic symptoms, we will often um, give more aggressive treatment, um, even if they don't have lung disease, because we want to try to prevent the lung disease um, and also aggressively treat ulcerations. And then um, we did a study looking for risk factors of uh, certain infections that occur in patients on a lot of immune suppression and found that MDA5 was a risk factor for that specific infection. So we would also consider, consider antibiotic um, prophylaxis for this group of patients as well. And then uh, the other potential impact is um, with the use of rituximab. So rituximab is a medication that um, gets rid of the B cells in our body and such the antibodies that the B cells produce. And there was a clinical trial, the rituximab and myositis trial or RIM trial that had both children and adults, but primarily adults. And um, this study did not meet its primary endpoint, but most rheumatologists feel that it was a success. 83% um, of patients did have clinical improvement during the trial. And importantly, there is what we call a steroid sparing effect, meaning that uh, patients were able to reduce their total dose of steroid during the treatment. Um, and as many of you probably know, steroids have a lot of um, bad side effects when they're used uh, for a really long time. So that's um, really important. So when they went back to um, sort of re-review the data from this trial, they found that uh, the patients enrolled that had MSAs, and in this study, they were the MSAs that are most commonly seen in adults, which are actually different from children. So th these are JO1 and MY2. Um, they were they had a better response to rituximab. And then when they looked at the levels of the MSAs, they actually found that the level of the antibody decreased with treatment as well. So kind of in the rheumatology world, we have extrapolated that, um, that rituximab may be beneficial in patients that do have um, MSAs detected and at least um, anecdotally uh, when patients don't respond to the first line therapies, or maybe they have more severe disease, we have seen um, a positive response to um, rituximab in most cases. 
So um, while all of this is really great and it's always good to have um, more knowledge, it's really important to acknowledge um, some of the limitations uh, and gaps in our knowledge. So the first and foremost is not all patients follow these principles. You may be um, thinking about your own child and know their antibody and say, my child doesn't look like this at all. And that would be um, perfectly normal. Um, these are just associations. And um, number two, we don't really know if the antibodies themselves cause tissue damage. And if we did know that, then we could directly um, target those antibodies or B cells um, more regularly to try to, to try to get rid of them. And, uh, and next MSAs alone can't direct our treatment at diagnosis. So while I just shared with you that there are some things that may influence our recommendations for treatment, um, we really do look at the whole patient that's in front of us, the symptoms that they have. We look at labs, we look at our exam, um, we look at certain imaging studies, and we kind of incorporate all of that information into our recommendations. There are also some important limitations in testing. So not all um, institutions send this lab to the same, uh, send this test to the same lab and different labs uh, run the test differently. And we have seen discrepant results. Um, and we, uh, we think there's a lab that's a gold standard, but it's not really proven to be a gold standard. So um, that can be somewhat of an issue. And then um, lastly, about 30% of patients have uh, don't have the MSAs that we know about. They either uh, have, you know, maybe a different, their disease happens in a different pathway, or they have an MSA that we just haven't detected yet. Um, so for those patients, we can't use that information uh, to influence our management. So that's all I have. Um, I would love to answer any questions that you all have um, to the best of my ability. And yeah, I think people have the ability to. You can to put, yes, you can put questions in the chat or oh, okay. we have one question from, uh, from Mike Parnell about uh, the rituximab study. And uh, the question is, were there NXP2 children in the rituximab study? Oh, I don't know off the top of my head. So, um, so there were pretty few children in the study overall, so they weren't really able to uh, directly do that same analysis where they're looking at certain MSA groups and did they respond better or not, um, unfortunately, but that would be really nice to know. Yeah, we're kind of just, um, yeah, like I said, extrapolating the fact that the, we think the MSAs are important in the disease and the rituximab helps to get rid of those. So yeah, not the, not the strongest data, but it's something. Great. Uh, anyone can, you can please put your questions in the chat or just speak out every, you know, take yourself off mute and, uh, and we'll hear you. I've got another one, Jim. It's Mike. Yeah, please. So Je Jessica, are there any like tracking studies or anything that are, you know, following kids and their treatment protocols with, and, and kind of tying them to their, like my daughter's an NXP2 uh, autoantibody. So like, are they gathering that data to show what medications and treatments seem to be working and not working for, for the different um, uh, children with different autoantibodies or is that really not been done yet? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, um, so I think it is that data is being collected through the CARA registry. You, uh, you may have heard of CARA. So that's um, sort of the North American registry of um, like arthritis, lupus, and JDM basically. And um, we, follow patients. The goal is to follow patients for 10 years. I think we started this latest registry two years ago. Um, and we tried to collect all, you know, what treatments they were on, what antibodies they had, 
and um, do that kind of comparative, we call it comparative effectiveness, looking at different uh, treatment regimens and different patients. Um, that is sort of the goal of the care registry long-term, but it definitely takes some time um, to gather that data, especially at enough, you know, sufficient numbers. And, um, and then there's also the problems with the limitations in testing, though, thankfully, they've added biosamples to the JDM registry, too. So now we can uh, test the antibodies all at once in the cohort and have that information in a very, um, in a way that we feel very confident in. So, yeah, I, I'm very hopeful that a lot of that research will be done in the future. Other questions? A uh, question from, uh, from Dana. Um, do myositis specific autoantibodies stick with the kids through adulthood? Do they ever go away? Great question. Really good question. Yeah. So we typically don't check them again after the initial diagnosis. We kind of think of them as more of a um, uh, more helpful early in the disease course. Um, so I don't know, <laughs> we should, it would be really great. I think if we did know that the levels of antibodies really did correlate with disease activity, that would be even more evidence that they play up an important role in disease. Um, so that is definitely a very interesting question. Um, but I think, I think we don't know exactly. Right. Jessica, follow up on that, on, on that question. Um, um, would, would it, would it make some sense to, um, to kind of assume that if, if, uh, autoantibody levels didn't decrease as someone moves into adulthood, that there might be some probability of ongoing disease or flaring in the future? Well, I guess it would depend on, you know, if they do kind of directly cause tissue damage. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, then probably yes. Um, but there's also a possibility that they're, um, that they are sort of a result of some other downstream immune response and not sort of directly involved. So they're like a clue, but they're not the cause. So um, if we knew that information, then I think we could answer that question better, but mm -hmm. yeah, does that help? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, very much, thanks. Yeah, I, got, I got another one, Jim, kind of, kind of similar to yours. So. It, for the kids that have reached remission, um, have, have they been like studied or tested at all to see like what's different about their, their B cells or, you know, what, what's turned off the disease. And, um, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm explaining my question correctly, but yeah, um, yeah, like what's different in their bodies once they are no longer active, like have the B yes. cells corrected themselves or, you know, what, what, what turns it off? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You're asking all the questions that we ask as, uh, researchers and pediatric rheumatologists too. So yeah, that we would love to know that. And, um, a lot of my research does look into that. I don't think we have a great answer yet, but hopefully, um, you know, we do try to directly compare the different groups and the different courses to try to understand why there is so much difference in terms of um, some patients responding with pretty minimal medication, whereas other patients need like five different medications. Um, so yeah, that would be really helpful information. And um, my specific research uses single cell um, RNA sequencing. So we look at sort of individual immune cells, and we can get a lot of data about those immune cells. Um, so hopefully we will get some more answers and we've been doing more collaborative work to have, um, you know, across different centers, different cure JN COEs to really be able to study that at a larger scale. So we can draw some um, more significant conclusions um, from that type of work. But yeah, these are really good questions. See, 
Great. We have a, a question from Brianna and another one from uh, Waleska. So do they have myositis panels done again when patients have reached remission? Um, so typically we don't test again. Um, you could ask your rheumatologist to recheck it. Like I wouldn't be opposed to resending it to see, um, but they, I don't think they quantify the antibody levels usually. So even if they see it um, like very weakly expressed, whereas um, maybe at diagnosis, it was like really strong. Um, they don't really distinguish that in the, in the lab tests that we're able to get. Um, so I would take it with a grain of salt. Like if they say, oh, it's still positive, I wouldn't be super disappointed because maybe it's just barely detectable, um, but it's decreased a lot. Um, yeah. Hello, have any of these studies included people of Hispanic backgrounds? From all of my research, reading and research, it seems like we have been excluded. Yeah, very good point. So, um, so the NIH study, I think, is prime is predominantly uh, white patients. I want to say like seventy to eighty percent, and the care registry is also about eighty percent. Um, this is a problem for sure, and definitely. Um, something that uh, we're working on at many sites um, are at UCSF. We have a very uh, large Hispanic population. So we have um, all of our consents in Spanish and we have included, I think like 30% of our patients are Hispanic. So we do have a good representation there. Um, but certainly we think it's extremely important to include patients from all different backgrounds so that we can really say that the, the research is for everyone. Um, so yes, thank you for asking that question. Yes. Other questions? Well, why you folks are, are, are thinking of um, any additional questions, I'd, I'd like to turn it over for a few minutes to the, uh, the chairperson of our board of directors. Um, uh, <clears throat> Nikki Han. Nikki's going to share with us a little bit about um, her family's story um, and the importance of, of autoantibody testing, not just to her family, but uh, perhaps to yours as well. Nikki, over to you. Thanks, Jim. And, and thank you, Jessica, for presenting all um, on that. It was so thank interesting. Thank you for I, inviting me. Yeah, we're, we're so happy to invest in you and have you on the Cure JM team. So thank you. Um, my, my story is that I have, I have four children. Uh, my third daughter, Addie, is 12 years old. She was diagnosed eight years ago at the age of four, um, diagnosed at uh, Columbia's Children's Hospital in New York City by a really wonderful um, like grandfatherly type rheumatolo pediatric rheumatologist who immediately recommended that she get um, the MSA testing. And so we went through the Oklahoma lab, which I think you were suggesting earlier, Jessica is considered to yeah. be the gold standard. Um, and um, she was positive for MDA5. So that, that informed, you know, kind of next steps for us. She wasn't presenting with any lung issues. It was predominantly skin and muscle involvement at the time. And um, at Dr. Eichenfield and Dr. Ryder in collaboration with her, they recommended that she go for further pulmonary testing and lung, um, lung examinations. And she had interstitial lung disease. Um, so it was diagnosed, thankfully for us, very early right away. And I attribute, it, attribute that to having the MSA testing done immediately. Otherwise, we would never have gone to a pulmonologist until she presented with um, lung involvement symptoms. So I feel very strongly that patients um, should get the MSA testing done right away. Um, and over the years, as I've spoken to so many of you, many of you who are on this call today, but of course other families in the CureJM sphere, I, I find it kind of disheartening and interesting when I hear that so many kids aren't tested for MSAs right away. So I'm curious, Jessica, I was just wondering, do you automatically have all kids tested for MSAs? If, maybe it's a new one. Good. Yes, yeah, definitely. I just feel like for Addie's sake, that was what got us the right course of treatment right away. And thankfully her lung involvement didn't progress. In fact, within, I think it was a year and a half or two years, um, all of her lung lesions had cleared up. 
Uh, she wasn't experiencing any issues with breathing or um, you know, physical activity as it related to breathing. So in my, you know, my humble opinion is if you have if your child hasn't been tested for myositis specific antibodies, that you ask your doctor to do it. My my understanding, and I don't know if this is still the case because I, I know that there are commercial labs that do this kind of testing as well as the Oklahoma um, Center, but that it's expensive and it takes a long time, and sometimes insurance companies don't pay for it in its entirety. So a lot of times doctors will, you know, not automatically offer it up right away, but, but I can't stress enough, you know, how meaningful it was for Addie's um, treatment and, and um, you know, just it, in my mind, it really saved us a lot of additional heartache that comes, that already comes along with a kid being newly diagnosed with JDM. Um, so my, my message to everyone is if your kid hasn't been tested to please, please ask your doctor for testing. Um, and then, you know, look back at these slides that Jessica has presented today and learn about the associations related with those um, MSAs and, and ask, ask questions of your doctor. I'm available all the time to, to speak to anyone. I'm certainly not an expert on the topic, but I've talked to many families over the years about it. Um, and my, I'll stick my email in the chat. I'm on the, the website as well, but I would be happy to chat with families about how to go about even asking for it if you're uncertain or uncomfortable doing that. And I'll turn, it, I'll turn it back to you, Jim, or to Jessica. Uh, thank, thank you, Nikki. I actually do have a follow-up question um, that from a topic you raised uh, for Jessica. Um, and, um, and, and that really has to do with um, the, the differences that you see in the sort of gold standard, which I, which I think is a, uh, you know, kind of a, <clears throat> you know, an, an immunosuppressive kind of testing as opposed to uh, line blots or ELISA, what do you, what, what are you recommending in terms of, uh, of what patients uh, um, ideally can pursue or should pursue in terms of timely turnaround and, um, and fundamental accuracy of the test? Yeah, so like um, Nikki said, we do consider Oklahoma Myositis Research Foundation to be kind of the gold standard that hasn't been proven, but I think among the, um, the JDM sort of experts in the country, I know that they all think that it's the best um, test and it uses um, immunofluorescence as opposed to those other methods that you mentioned. And immunofluorescence is the gold standard for autoantibody testing sort of across immune, autoimmune diseases. Um, so Yes, we, what we did here at UCSF, um, you're in the institution, the, the clinical lab doesn't necessarily want to send the test there because it is more expensive. So there are other commercial labs um, like AIRUP. And um, what we did is we said, we know this one's better. So why don't we do side-by-side -side testing? Um, and we sent each patient sample for, I think the next five patients to both labs and showed them how discrepant their results were um, and how the, the OMRF um, testing really did fit more um, with, uh, with the patients in front of us. And, um, and that convinced them that we should always send the testing there and not to these other labs. Um, it's not always discrepant, so it's probably like if that's your only option, it's probably better than not doing the test at all. Um, but that is kind of what I tell other rheumatologists at other institutions where they say um, they can't send the test. I tell them what we did and hopefully they can advocate at their institutions to always send the tests to OMRF. Cause it's not like we're sending a ton of tests. Like JDM is very rare. It's, you know, really important. And um, we can usually convince, um, at least in pediatrics, we can usually convince the labs to send it there. Um, yes. And then uh, there is a question, yes, about MSA testing. So, um, so yeah, so basically what it is, is they take a blood sample and then they run a specific test that looks for um, these specific antibodies that target um, these specific parts of our body. And that's where the name of the myositis specific antibodies come from. Um, like MDA5, it targets this protein MDA5. Um, 
So if you know that your son has is MDA five positive, he um, likely did have MSA testing done at some point. Hi, I have a question. Um, my name is Angelique Jones. I have an eight-year-old daughter who was diagnosed almost two years ago. She uh, has the NXP2 antibody as well. Um, and initially, when she was um, in the hospital, she was in the hospital for about nine days and went through a ton of testing. I mean, tons and tons. Um, and the rheumatologist who is her main rheumatologist, and she's Wonderful, amazing, so great. Um, but initially, she didn't really think that um, our do- my daughter was a candidate for JDM based on the presentation. Since mm-hmm. she, you know, the the papules and the rash were missing, um, she had severe severe trunk and muscle weakness. Um, mm-hmm. Couldn't lift her head up off the floor. That's how you know she got weak so fast. Um, and it just didn't really seem like a very classic presentation in our rheumatologist's mind. I don't know if the test for the um, MSA is kind of what changed her mind. And I know it was definitively di- uh, diagnosed by a muscle biopsy eventually. Um, mm-hmm. But initially she was kind of res- not resistant. That's kind of too strong of a word. She was hesitant to say that she was for sure a JDM candidate just because she looked so much different than the rest of the JDM can- uh patients that she had is there um is there anything that is being done to kind of share these um and obviously webinars like this from parents and you know cure jm people um but is there anything else that is being done through either the center of excellences and you probably already know this but maybe not in a center of excellence for hospitals that are um, treating this just to make these more prevalent or more, you know, make the dermatologist more aware. Um, maybe it would cut down on the length of hospital stay uh, or, you know, be able to better direct the testing. Sorry, yes. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, I'm sorry that um, you had that experience, but I'm glad that she ultimately did get diagnosed. But if you remember from the picture for NXP2, they do have less rash and the rash is what makes it easy to diagnose in patients. So if there's less rash, it can be harder to diagnose. Um, if you're not used to some of the other, um, features, um, but maybe I'll let Jim kind of answer this question about the clinical care network or other things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yes. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, yes, Angel, Angelique, I think there are, um, uh, several things that, that, um, um, happen on both a, a national and an international basis. Uh, that that uh, kind of falls into the area of, of clinician education, pediatric rheumatologist education, and um, uh, and and development of expertise um, or, and basic knowledge around JDM uh, diagnosis and and, and care. Um, what one of them is uh, is the Global Conference on Myositis, which just took place uh, a couple of weeks ago in. Uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, I think there were about 400 researchers and primarily pediatric rheumatologists from around the uh, the world. Uh, the United Kingdom, the United States was well represented. Jessica actually made a presentation um, there at um, at at the con- at the conference. Actually, and and so this this information um, um, as research happens um, and advances are made each year. Um, that is that is that is one place where it is shared. There are a couple of other organizations um, in Europe that that meet annually, um, clinicians and researchers. Here in the United States, Jessica mentioned an organization called uh, called CARA, uh, which is essentially an organization of pediatric rheumatologists in the United States and Canada uh, are represented. I think about 400 members uh, total in in CARA. And, and I'm happy to say that that cure JM and, and JDM as a disease has um, as he has emerged as a very significant educational player through uh, you know through this organization of CARA, and um, and and again the sort of education around um, diagnostics, um, the connections that pediatric rheumatologists make with each other, 
Um, the understanding that, that pediatric rheumatologists, I think particularly younger pediatric rheumatologists and fellows can make with more established clinicians in, in JDM very much happens through this organization and through CARA in the United States. Um, and then finally, CureJM has, uh, has just launched, uh, uh, it's very much in its infancy, um, um, so kind of you might think of it as sort of an expanded center of excellence um, effort to bring more pediatric rheumatology departments into CureJM's inner circle. So, so we're in, in educating those pediatric rheumatologists through our through our network and, and I think particularly through an annual um, um, clinician education program that, uh, uh, that we do online that typically attracts about 150 or so pediatric rheumatologists uh, to our annual medical symposium. So there are a lot of things that, that in fact are, are happening to, um, to increase the knowledge and, and hopefully the connectedness and the confidence that, that pediatric rheumatologists who are, um, you know, phenomenal pediatric rheumatologists, but may not have a lot of experience in JDM, JDM being as rare as it is, where they can go for, for assistance, for referral, for help, for consultation, for second opinions, for those, for, for, for those kinds of things. Um, excellent question at CureJM. You know, we think this is a big responsibility that, that we have to expand um, our, our footprint and to sort of welcome more pediatric rheumatologists into CureJM's inner circle. And, and, and hopefully we're having an impact on, on improving the quality of care through doing this. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Any other questions? Uh, can you hear me? This is Alice Cornett, I have a question. Yes, please Alice. Um, I have a grandson who he was diagnosed when he was around seven. He's now 22. He no longer deals with a pediatric rheumatologist. He de deals with a rheumatologist that deals exclusively with adults. How are they linked into all of this information that you're talking about the care, which is for the pediatric rheumatologist, but, um, I'm not real comfortable with the guy that's treating my grandson, but I'm not my grandson and he seems to be okay with the guy, but there's been like rework and redo and oops, missed that. I mean, is there information he, can he link into that group that deals with the pediatric rheumatologists? Uh, yes, he's, he, he, he certainly can. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, Jessica or Nikki, you want to, want to, want to weigh in on this, but, um, you know, we're, we're also doing, um, you know, more research and more emphasis on transition, which actually happens at, or should happen ideally at a, at a fairly early age, maybe, maybe 14, 15, 16 years of old years of age, as we know, um, that, uh, that patients with, especially patients with active disease will eventually need to transfer to an adult rheumatologist. Um, we have a, you know, we have a small list of adult rheumatologists that where we've received very positive feedback in terms of the, uh, the quality of care that, that JDM patients have received after making that, that, that transition. And I think we recognize that this is an area that needs, um, you know, significantly more attention than perhaps it's received in the in the in the past. Um, you know, a number of the uh, of our longstanding JDM doctors have, you know, have have long sort of. Um, I guess I, you know, I guess I would say despaired in a way over this over the the the. the aspects that, you know, essentially children age out of the pediatric care and we lose track of them. Um, and, you know, this is something that given time and resources, we want to correct and put more attention to. What, what I could say is that if you would, if you would like to contact me, um, I'd be, you know, I'd be happy to um, look for any connections or, or second opinions that, uh, that your grandson might find helpful. Uh, what would be the best way to contact you? Uh, James Minow, uh, all one word. I'm sorry, James.minow, M-I-N-O-W, 
at curejm.org. Thank you. All right. Jim, I'll just jump in and, and yes. kind of echo what you said previously about CureJM's extraordinary presence at GCOM, which he mentioned just happened. Um, also, our medical symposium that we do annually that he mentioned draws, you know, 100 uh, rheumatologists across the country and our clinical care network that we've established. All three of those really work to establish greater relationships with all rheumatologists across the board. And we're constantly hearing from our families about the kind of wonky you know, transition period that they go through with their kids as they move from a pediatric rheumatologist to an adult rheumatologist. So I, I, we hear you and we know it's a problem and we're working on our end to address it. And we've met with families and we've talked with um, you know, pediatric rheumatologists as well as adult rheumatologists to find out what it is that we can do as an organization to help bridge the gap for families. So I would encourage you to reach out to Jim and speak with him because we would love it's important for us to hear the feedback of what families are experiencing so that we can work to do our part in helping make that smoother. So in pediatrics, we are very well trained across all the diseases that we see and we have to be because there's only like 400 of us in the country, but in the adult world, they specialize in diseases. So they're, they'll do like RA, they'll do lupus, they'll do dermato. And there's also a lot of care of um, dermatomyositis patients by dermatologists in the adult world as well. So um, I think you have to kind of seek out the adult rheumatologists as much as possible that are really experts in myositis. And um, sometimes it might be helpful to think out of the box, like actually at UCSF, um, one of the dermatologists who specializes in room derm. So she does like only care of autoimmune skin conditions. Um, she sees most of the dermatomyositis patients at our institution. So um, it, it's just a little bit different in the adult world in terms of how they um, care for various patients. It's aging out at 14 across the board. Oh, I think what Jim was saying is to, to introduce the transition process early. Yes, that's exactly what I meant. I'm sorry if 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 I misspoke. Is is that um, yes, the transition experts really you know really suggest that you know around the age of 14 is when you as a parent and to some extent your your child need to start thinking about the early phases of transition to where you know adolescents start looking more and more at self-care and self-knowledge and less reliance on their parents as caregivers in preparation for transition to adulthood. Okay, well, thank you all very much for uh, being with us. This was a terrific session. And uh, if any of you have um, any additional questions that you think of later, feel free to uh, email uh, email me and I'll make sure that either Nikki or, or, or Jessica uh, will get those questions for follow-ups. Again, my, my email is james.minow, M-I-N-O-W at gmail.org. And I want to thank you all for, for being with us. And thanks again to Nikki and Jessica for an excellent presentation. <laughs>